shortly. Hi guys, welcome to Feature Bootcamp Week 2. This is going to be part of our 8-week so course. for anyone who's new to Discord uh, stage channel, it's basically like um, if you have a question or you'd like to chat, there should be a little button that says request to speak. It's like you're kind of like raising a little hand. Um, or you could type in the text channel. So there's a little text channel on the side just to click in chat. And uh, Connor can be up on the stage. Sorry about that. I already started the stream. I just didn't realize I was muted on <laughs> Discord. This has been a, a heck of a class so far. Okay, we're getting going. We are starting with our week two of our eight-week program, where we will take you from idea to finished draft of a brand new feature script in eight weeks. Let's get going. So here's everything coming up. We have this new session of pilot class, which starts on Sunday in just two days. That's running from 11 to 1 on Sundays for six weeks. You'll go from idea to finished draft of a brand new pilot. We have a new class for best protagonist for your story. That'll be Thursday the 23rd at 6 o'clock. We have a bunch of classes coming up on WordCamp as well, which is our novel writing server. We have introduction to writing novels. That will be Saturday, February 25th at noon. Prose and Premise, which is week one of our new session of novel boot camp. That's going to be March 4th, noon to 2. Query letter class, March 8th at 6. We're going to break down successful queries from novels and also look at queries as an organizational tool to kind of understand the structure of a whole book. And then we'll look, take that info further into an outlining class, March 16th at 6 p.m. So we have uh, discounted rates for unlimited members for things like consultations and development sessions on things like everything from logline to just brainstorming or things like that if you want to. Evaluations of first chapter or first page proofreading, developmental editing, line editing, all of that you can find at scriptcamp.net slash coverage. Boot campers will get 50 to 90% off those normal rates. So we're going to have three boot camps going on. We normally have three happening at Script Camp at any one time. We have features, TV, and novels. Features, Friday, 6 to 8. Novels, Saturdays, 12 to 2. Pilots, March starting March 5th, it will be Sundays, 11 to 1. So here's what we've got today. We're looking at breaking the story. So story beat summary is what we're talking about. We're going to try to move from this first step of figuring out what is the movie that I am writing? What is the logline, genre, premise, comps? And we're going to try to advance to the second step, which is figuring out generally what happens in the movie. So we're going to try to work on this story beats outline, which is a list of all the major events of the story. It doesn't have to include absolutely everything. And it, there can be holes and there can be gaps. There can be things missing. But all of this requires just a really strong understanding of structure and what makes three-act stories really work. Um, so next week we'll be doing story beats. We'll be moving from story beats to scene cards. And scene cards are a full paragraph for every scene in the movie, which includes the page numbers that you expect it to take place on. So that by the end, you're going to have a really clear roadmap for your entire story with a, a sense of what's going to be happening on essentially every page. Um, we're moving from scene cards to beginnings of the script on the 17th so that's going to be our week three class or sorry our week four class um and from then on you're going to be writing about 20 to 25 pages a week all the way up, up until the end of the draft which should conclude on april 21st so um you can become a supporting member if you'd like to be in the rest of this boot camp or if you'd like to participate in other camps classes workshops and activities that we have on this server and on our on our many other servers such as WordCamp, CodeCamp, ToonCamp. We have classes in everything from animation to programming and coding, all underneath the Script Camp banner. So by signing up for Script Camp, you will get access to everything that we do here. By becoming an unlimited member, you will get every single class and uh, se session and meeting that we have on any of these sites or any of these servers. Um, you can volunteer. If you know a skill or language you'd like to teach, you can let me or Nacho know. And you can tell your friends. If you refer somebody, you will both get a free month of unlimited subscription and a free month of Arc Studio Pro, which is a great screenwriting software. So if you still need to enroll and you have not yet done so and you'd like to be in the rest of this camp, then you can go to scriptcamp.net. You can go to membership. And you can start your free trial by clicking down here and get access to over 100 hours of events every month. Um, okay, so we'll start with um, check-in. Anyone who was here last week, anyone who is for sure participating in the boot camp, we want to hear an update. So if you have modified your idea that you had started last week or you've changed to a new idea, I think we had at least one student saying she was pivoting to a new idea, so we'd be glad to hear about it. Um, and we're going to go into structure today. So what is structure? 
what does the three-act movie look like? Where do these things, where do the major events fall on different page benchmarks? How can we pace effectively and how can we keep the audience moving through the story and all these really important elements of outlining, like these things that we should be solving while we are outlining. So we're trying to divorce the process of figuring out what happens from the process of actually executing it on the page. Because if you're trying to figure out what happens and trying to write successful scenes, you're essentially doubling the workload. So we emphasize here at Script Camp this really, really structured method of figuring out what happens on every single page before you even start writing those pages to begin with. So you don't need to even download screenwriting software like ArcStudio until halfway through the course, at which point you're gonna be writing about four to five pages a day if you just write on weekdays. Um, but figuring out everything beforehand will make it so much easier to actually work through those pages. So by the time you have figured everything out, it should make the rest of the plotting, or it should make the rest of the executing of that script a breeze. Um, so we have a poll in the chat. If you have not yet signed up, but you intend to, you can scroll up just a little bit and you'll find a list of blue numbers. So you can vote number one, and that will in indicate that you intend to sign up for the boot camps and for unlimited membership. And we will give you instant access to all of those exclusive member chat channels. Um, so we'll look at structures today. Um, so maybe we might get so far as to theme and argument, but we, we actually in this course, rare, in this particular class meeting, rarely get through all of the material, um, and I'd rather spend the time making sure that everyone's idea is on track and moving forward okay, rather than doing lots and lots of slideshow stuff. So if um, if folks have ideas that they are trying to get into shape to, to move forward to this next step um, in outlining, then today is the day to ask those questions. Um, we will start with last week's um, assignment. So if you were here last week, um, all you really had to do was, one, read a script. So uh, hopefully everyone who was in this boot camp has read a script and is now ready to answer just basic questions about it. What was it? What did you like? What did you learn? You're going to post your log line in the assignments channel. Um, and uh, actually, I guess we'll just use the classroom channel for now because we're in a free public room, not in our boot camper channels. Um, and uh, don't worry about this thing about blockbuster moments. I hadn't actually gotten to that in the last class. Um, so the goal from last time was to write that logline and refine the logline and improve it if you had already gotten a little bit of work done on it and to incorporate that feedback for today so that hopefully by today you will have that idea really really solid you know exactly what the movie you're trying to write is going to be and there's no other obstructions that are stopping you from coming up with your story beats so um we're going to how does this how will we do this um maybe we should just is there a hand raising function nacho yes there is yes okay great um and go ahead I was going to say also you can invite them up as well. Oh, cool. Okay, perfect. So yeah, we're trying out this new channel type for this uh, class today. It's changed from the last time that we attempted to use these, so still getting used to it and working out a couple kinks, but I think I like this setup generally. It's easier to get rid of trolls, at least. Um, so, uh, go ahead. It seems like it... I was just going to... I don't know if anyone can mention it, if they are able to see that... It seems like the video just automatically plays for everyone, so you don't. they don't have to, like click on your name or oh, watch great. the stream like it's just automatic. cool i didn't realize that that's awesome um okie doke so let's start with who has a new log line from last week or a refined log line that they would like some response to or feedback on let's see a raised hand Joya says me. I think so. There must. There's got to be a button you can click to raise hands, your hand. But I'll just click invite you up. Hi, Joya. Hi. How are you? Good. This feels like a radio show now, doesn't it? It's like caller, you're on. <laughs> Hello. If you have relationship <laughs> questions for us. <laughs> okay. So you've got a new idea, right? Yes. Totally new. And I I posted it. It's a little further up. Mm -hmm. Um. Let me see if I can post it again. But um, I got it. Oh, okay. All right. So why don't you read this for us and explain a little bit about this one? Okay. Uh, so let's see. Let me scroll back up to it. Okay. Um, okay. So, and they're both the same. Uh, they're both the same thing. Uh, just different log lines. Oh, okay. And their dying child is... When their dying child needs a bone marrow transplant, the Cameroonian mother and Italian father must finally face the families they hid the relationship from to save their child's life. Okay, and maybe read the second one. 
Okay. Uh, when the son of an Italian and Cameroonian falls deathly ill, the couple must bring the families who know nothing of their family together to find a suitable donor. All right. Thanks for that. And this is a uh, drama, I'm guessing? Uh, yeah, romantic dramedy. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, more drama. So. Yeah, wait, romantic? I'm missing the romance from... If there's a... If there's a romance in the story, it's not quite apparent in the logline. So maybe we can just keep, we'll just call it drama for now. Let me read again and make sure, yeah. make sure I understand. Okay. When their dying child needs a bone marrow transplant, the, I, we would just say a Cameroonian mother, and I guess you would probably say her Italian husband. Must, okay. oh. They are husband and wife, right? They are married? Yes. Okay must finally face the families they hid their relationship from to save their child's life. Okay, I think I am starting to see it. Let me let me just make sure that this that the second one doesn't illuminate something that I'm missing here. The couple must bring the families who know nothing of the family together to find a suitable donor. Okay, I would go with the first one. The second one is a little confusing to me and I'm not quite sure w what you mean here. Let's stick with this first one for now. And so the first thing is remember we have to stick with the main character. So is the mom the main character, or is the dad? Oh, um, I guess that would be the mom. I guess okay. initially I was thinking the dying child, but yeah, I guess they couldn't be the main character because they're dying. So right, or I mean, yeah. I, the the we're looking for the most active character, right? And a dying child is not right. going to be able to really do any of this work. I mean, a dying child could be the lead of a movie, but it doesn't sound like they'd be the lead of this movie. This sounds like it. the obstacle that is to be overcome is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that these two people from different cultures that maybe, I, I guess you're saying they can't get along or that they have prejudice against each other. Is that right? So they, the families, is that yes. why they've concealed this from their families? Yes. Okay. So because of that, now it turns out that when their kid becomes sick, they need money. Is that why they need the families? Uh, they need a suitable donor. Oh, they need a donor. Okay. Um, and, sorry, whoops. A uh, donor match. Donor transplant. Okay, so who's the match? Um, it's going to end up being the Italian grandfather. Okay, but they don't know that to begin with. You're saying that they have to sort of audition different family members to see which one of them might be a match. Is that right? Right. Yeah, because the parents are not a, a match for the bone marrow. Oh, okay. So, so it's not a matter of money. It's not like we just need to get a bunch of money from the families. You're saying the only way to save the child is it's because there's not a direct match that we already have, so they need to check the family to see if anyone from the family can donate. Okay. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So, I think I'm starting to see the movie, and some of your comps might be something like, did, did you see, um, what's it called, um, Girl in a Coma, what's the movie, The the Big Sick. That was actually one of my comps. Great, okay. great, great. Okay, so yeah, I sort of see this in, in, it's like a drama that surrounds an illness, but isn't necessarily, you know, um, about, the, about the person with the illness necessarily, it's more about the people around them. And the kind of drama that it brings out of these people and forces them to sort of confront these, uh, like, mm, secrets that they have kept up until now. I, I, can, I can see it. And I think that you should maybe just frame the logline, first of all, a little more actively in terms of the main character. So a Camer Cameroonian mother and her Italian husband. Those nationalities are important, I guess. The, although m many readers at first might see that and not necessarily know that there would be any huge problem with a Cameroonian and an Italian being together. So the the question it might show up in your reader's mind, like, wait, why is there a secret? Why would they hide this relationship? That might that might come up. But I, I guess I, I can think of reasons why that might be. Um, and then I guess the other thing is to so frame this from the main character's perspective. So we want to say something like um, a, you know, you can describe your main character in terms of her if this is about the mom, personality or tactics that she would use. If if like she's the, a real hothead and her, her husband is the real cool headed one, something like that, which, which just expresses like, how are they going to go about solving this problem? Does that make sense? Or if she is like someone who, um, you know, has totally disowned her family in the past, or she, they've kept the secret and she's distanced herself from them as much as possible. And now she's very sort of secluded and shy, something like that. We're, we're looking for maybe just a little more description of the main character. You only need one or two words. 
it's not going to be a lot. You don't have to write a whole sentence about them, but we maybe just want to know how is only your character going to solve this problem? We're asking this question, why her? Mm -hmm. Why is it about her? Mm -hmm. um, and you can look at any story like that, right? It's like a guy needs to stop a bombing from happening. But then the question is always, well, why him though? Why is that character the one that this story needs to be about? And so in your case, I would think that this would be somebody who um, has, you know, really separated herself from her family um, and has, you know, moved very far away from them and is trying to get away from their old school values. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. I'm just guessing. So feel free, if you, if, if, if something sounds off, feel free to, of course, let me know. But um, so in, in that case, then you might describe your main character as like, I don't know, very forward thinking. What if she's like, would you describe her as like a real hippie or something like that? We're, then we're going to start to see, okay, that's not only a personality type, but I can start to imagine that person a little bit more and maybe the tactics they would use. You don't have to use a total hippie, but that's just an example of like, okay, that's a description of a character that would be more forward thinking and try, well, I could understand them trying to separate from their traditional upbringing or something like that. So be a little more specific when it comes to the description of the main character. We want it to feel really active from her point of view and like it's going to be about her doing stuff in order to accomplish this goal. So face the families isn't a super active and specific goal. I think that she's trying to identify a bone marrow match from this family. That sounds like is the actual crux of what she's doing, right? Right. Okay. So she must reunite or reconnect with her estranged family to find uh, a donor match. Um, you know, within by the end of the month. I'm just making something up just to give it that sense of like urgency and really urgency. yeah specific time frame or ticking clock that it can happen in. It, it's okay if you don't have that. Like I think it's you, with a disease like this, it's not always clear that you have to have it by the end of the month or they'll die. But for the purposes of the log line, you might just want to pick a kind of time frame for this to take place over so that we understand we can sort of like imagine is this going to be a movie that takes place over the course of 10 years or is this going to be a movie that takes place over the course of one weekend or is this going to like because i could see the same story or the same log line applying to either one it might be that over time you have to very slowly reconnect with your family or it could be we ha we're, th we're throwing together a big barbecue reunion and by the end of this reunion we have to get that donor sorted out so you can choose how to, you, you can frame it how you want, but just try to be really clear on what is the time frame that the movie takes place over, especially for a drama where it's like, this could be for unlimited amounts of time. Gotcha. Okay. okay. So okay. specific. And to what you were saying earlier. Go ahead. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're fine. I, I was just um, reading what I was typing out loud. So feel free to speak. Go ahead. Okay. So with what you said, yes, I'll, Take out the Italian and Cameroonian because that just, that's just extra stuff that they'll find out in the movie anyway. And that's like right. you said, like, that doesn't really add when you come from cultures that are forward thinking like Americans. So, so yeah, main okay. three things, specific main character, make sure she feels really active and it feels like this is her story. She's the one that needs to perform actions and overcome obstacles to accomplish this tangible and really clear goal um the ticking clock or the sense of urgency should be evident in the log line too so if there is a really tough time limit if there is that hourglass ticking away then we should know what it is and that will help us with a sense of the scope too because the scope might be t t over you know we have 10 years to solve this problem or it might be we have three days to solve this problem and you should just let us know what kind of how much intensity there will really be in that story oh gotcha right and the more intense the better Usually, um, it's, it's, you can do it how you want. Like, it's a drama. It's, this is not a thriller, so it doesn't have to be breakneck pace. It doesn't have to be we have one weekend or three days to, to solve the problem. That's one way of doing it. You could also say this does take place over the course of years. Like, if, that, if you see a version of it where we have to really slowly win over this, this estranged family and mend these numerous complicated fractured relationships, then maybe you see a version of it that, that takes way longer. So it's, it's really going to be up to you how that plays out. Thanks. So, um, can, can you put your screen back up? Thanks. Thanks. My screen meaning um, the, you want to see the text like that? I mean, yeah, yeah the text. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. And I can copy this into the chat too, if that helps. 
Oh, perfect. Questions? And I wasn't sure... Um, I wasn't sure whether or not my other comp could be... I haven't seen Fool's Russian, and I barely remember the big sick. So, um, but to something you were saying earlier about making sure your comps are what they are so that you're not setting up your audience for um, something unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, from reading about Fool's Russian, I thought it added the element of, you know... Um, the marriage, but, you know, these family dynamics. Um, so I don't know if anyone's seen the movie or um, whether that would be a reasonable or satisfactory comp to use for the second one. That's a good question. I haven't actually seen it either. I'm just going to paste the description into the chat if anybody wants a reminder. Um, anyone who has seen this, feel free to let us know if you think this is a good comp. But uh, is this a comedy or a drama, do you think? It says it's a um, rom-com. Yeah. Um, oh, The Fool's Russian? That's right. Yeah. Okay. So that one it, was a rom-com. That's okay. Yeah, yeah you, you, can, you can do that. If you see the movie having a lighter tone, then I think it might be a great comp. Um, if you see it having a darker tone, which, I mean, it's, it is about a pretty dark topic then I would pick something else. But... Yeah, yeah, it's it's a darker, yeah, yeah. So, so up to you. Um, if, so it's definitely more... If, if you see it as darker, I would pick some Because The Big Sick is already kind of a comedy, too. It has, like, comedic elements, too. We don't want to pick two comedies if your script is really serious. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, it's pretty serious, so... Um, okay. Okay, so might have I to do a little more shopping around for comps. Yeah, maybe some folks in the chat have suggestions too. All right, any questions left, Joya? Um, not at the moment. Great. Thanks for um, on this speaking up. Yeah, re it. refine this a little bit. Try to get this finalized by the end of the class if you can. And just be filling out that sketchbook, which is just going to be, you know, we want to include title genre logline comps at the top but then underneath that all of your other ideas there's nothing wrong that goes in there just start filling out everything else that you have got it okay perfect thank you thanks thank you. so much thanks, thanks a lot um anyone else who is in the boot camp and is intending to continue and wants to write a whole movie in eight weeks does somebody else have a refined logline from last time, if you were here for last class, or maybe you've changed an idea. Does anyone else want to share? Uh, Mitch, so are you, are you going to, you're going to be in the boot camp, Mitch? I'll invite you up. Hello. Hi. Uh, let me just copy paste it real quick. Okay, sure. So I know the genres don't really match the comps. I kind of need a. Oh, thank you, Jojo. Thank you. I did not know that. I forgot about the stage functionality. Anyways, um, yeah, this is. The title is Burning Out. The genres are crime, drama, and psychological thriller. I know those don't really go with comps, but uh, the logline is, after a botched heist, a hedonistic professional criminal and his cohort get put in a ramshackle, sa sh uh, ramshackle safe house packed with stashes of drugs. As conflicting details emerge about the crime, the criminals must maintain trust in each other until they're finally allowed to leave. The hmm. comps are Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, The Lighthouse, and Skimmering. All right. Um, it is a weird mix, but I think I can make it, you know. Okay, so this is what you're going to be writing in the boot camp? Yeah, if I keep going in this, then yeah. This is what I'm going to be working on. I, it's a little hazier of a concept, but that's why I want to tackle it, you know? Okay, why I sure. sure. Kind of, like, kind Let, of like, pin it down a bit. Right, okay, let's take a look. All right, um...
After a botched heist, a hedonistic professional criminal. What's a professional criminal? Can I just ask? Is that like a I guess, like or, I, I, or a robber? Or what do you mean? I'm thinking something like maybe like a safe cracker of some kind. Like something very precise and with his hands. Okay, I would say like that then. Just, like, I don't really have a reason for that yet. I just have like, I'm trying to establish character details. Okay. So a safe cracker. Okay, I would I would say that then. Most people don't know what a professional criminal is. Or if someone is a professional criminal, there's another name for what they do that we, we would be... It would be easier to understand and identify, I guess I would say. Um, a professional criminal and his cohort get put in a ramshackle safe house packed with stashes of drugs. But as conflicting details emerge about the crime, the criminals m must maintain trust in each other until they're finally allowed to leave. So when you say conflicting details emerge, where would they emerge from if they're the only ones who are there? Telling stories, reminiscing. Um, one of them's younger, but he's not like super young. He's like 35. The other one is up there. The safe cracker is up there. And he kind of got like this Ozzy Osbourne vibe of like, how are you still alive? And he's like, I don't know, but I'm enjoying it. And um, so he, these two um, have been around the block a couple times. And so they have a lot of stories about the people they were working with that day. Um, like certain cops in the area, that they know are dirty and in on it with them that showed up to the scene. Um, they get... Um, there's a person there that um, there's a person that visits them and gives them pretty much anything they ask for. Um, so he gives them newspapers from time to time. And so through that and through letters to the safe house, they start to get more and more information about what happened. Okay. But so they must maintain trust in each other or until they're finally allowed to leave. It Their just... stories start to like, not line up with what they've been saying before or with what they already know about what happened or with what they saw details that emerge that's the thing it's a very dialogue heavy thing that i'm pitching here and i don't really have any of the dialogue written down right that's okay it's you wouldn't you guys in a yeah, house just we very, wouldn't have any dialogue written know. yet just the we're at the premise stage still so you don't you don't have yeah. to have any any dialogue yet but um yeah. I'm just struggling to understand what the conflict is. So they both did a crime together, right? Yeah. And now they're hiding out after Basically, that crime. Basically, they're suspecting each other of potentially being a rat, potentially mm -hmm. having, like, tried to come away, like, having benefited more from it themselves. Like, they think that the other person tried to screw over the rest of the team, and they're the reason why they okay. start to become suspicious of each other. And one of your comps is not Reservoir Dogs, even though this is almost exactly like Reservoir Dogs. I should... You know, I... the funny thing is, the day I came up with this, I was thinking a lot about Reservoir Dogs. Mm -hmm. And it slipped my mind because I was, focusing, I was focusing on specifically, like, the house. I wasn't focusing on the fact that it was criminals, like, trying to recite a crime to each other, which is Reservoir Dogs. I was focusing on the fact that this is taking place over months and months and I say ramshackle safe house, the AC starts going out, the fridge breaks overnight, and they open up the fridge to everything, like, to the, like, the smell of, like, you know, bad meat now, and they have to get old, new groceries, and it's just, like, to me, I was focusing on the arduousness of this process of staying in the safe house, more so than the details of the crime emerging. The details of the crime emerging are important, and they're what drive the conflict but it's really more about the slow loss of sanity here the okay. slow loss of trust the slow erosion of everything and it's like a more implied paranormal at times i don't really know if i want to imply paranormality or if i want to just have like hallucinations or what but basically the skin and rank comparison comes in when the house starts shifting around them doors and rooms appear stairwells appear uh cabinets that weren't there before bed sheet patterns change just the most random little things and it feels almost like they have a maid sometimes but eventually it starts to get to the point where they find evidence on each other like that seems to be like too damning just to be laying around in a safe house especially since they're the only ones that have been here how does this get here i don't know it's sorry i'm rambling at this point
Oh, it's all good. <laughs> um, so I'm trying I mean, to contain my thoughts, and they're not really being that, contained. That's all right. So yeah, I would think Reservoir Dogs or Hateful Eight would be good comps for a story like this um or i did yeah. it first until i guess you continued talking about it and now i don't understand it at all anymore <laughs> if you're saying random supernatural things are happening in the house no it's okay it's your it, you can write whatever you want i don't even know yet it's it's a you know this just sounds like an experimental that's why I art to this is an experimental art film is that right not i mean ex as experimental as something this dialogue heavy can be i mm -hmm. think which i guess is rather Mm -hmm. But I never like yes, yeah, Skin and Rank is quite experimental. But I didn't really. I wanted to focus on something that could be a bit more, like catching it, trying to catch someone else in the lie, trying to actively play that game of mental chess. While also, it seems as though the house hates you, <laughs> and you're both like coming down off LSD. Like this combined, like sweltering, gross atmosphere. You know. So this is a super abstract and I mean this is not really a high concept movie pitch this is an experimental art house type of film so I mean the kind of guidance that All I right. would give to this are going to be totally different from what I would give to somebody who was trying to write you know like sort of more of a Hollywood style movie this is not really a Hollywood style movie That's is that fair. is that what you're saying That's fair I I guess I wasn't really I'm not really I, I guess so I don't <laughs> Okay, so yeah, you, you can write what you want. You, you can do this how you want. I guess I would say if you if this were going to be more of a traditional, straightforward Hollywood type movie, first of all, we need focus on a protagonist. A two people is not a protagonist. Mm -hmm. We need to have one of those take the lead as the active kind of driving force of your movie. Who I think that you need to frame the log line more concretely around. Um, so that would be the first thing I would say. And the second thing is that this is just like a lot of details in the logline that's leading to a very long sentence. Um, a botched heist, a yeah. hedonistic professional yeah. criminal in his cohort. Get I don't think I could even say this in one breath if I tried. Um, so I would maybe try to cut down on the number yeah. of clauses here and try to give a more concrete and straightforward goal for your main character, which is, it, and if we frame this more from one guy's point of view, it's not going to be they need to maintain trust in each other. It's going to be, I need to defeat this guy, essentially. Or I need to outwit my yeah. partner, or something. You could pick some word like that, right? Like I need to prove that he's the one yeah. that set us up, or I need to, you know, if we can frame it a little more adversarially from the point of view of your main character, it will be a little clearer what we're watching your main character try to accomplish, and it'll feel a little less like, well, this is just a bunch of conversations of people doing nothing. Which then again, the movie might be if you're describing it kind of like Skinner Rink, then that might be the case. At which point, I mean, nobody can give you notes that can help you with that. You you gotta you gotta kind of just show us what that would look like. Um, by by just yeah. taking a swing and writing it. Um, but yeah, maybe think of how you could frame this from that main character's POV and how we can understand we're watching this guy try to essentially survive, right? Yeah. Okay. So I mean, that's still helpful. That is still helpful because, well, I mean, both of them are. Like, I mean, I, I, I do understand the idea of like focusing on one main character here. Mm -hmm. I do sort of want to try it. I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm... This is so loose that I could draft this like five different ways sure. at this point. So I might try that. I might try the other way. I might try something completely different. I don't know. Okay. Well, I hope this has Thank just you given though. you some ideas or maybe like gotten some gears turning and made you just think of how I could present this or the different ways that I could take this. Yeah. Yeah. I've been writing down theme ideas and like events and like how they could tie into hidden motivations and, you know. Cool tying into bits of conversation earlier you know gotcha okay um well hope that helps thank you for sharing thank you um do we have any other refined log lines from last week or pe folks who are taking the boot camp who want to make sure that they're on track with their idea Kevin, all right, I'll invite up Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Yeah, uh, sorry, I didn't go to the last class, and I'm still not sure about taking it, but I'm curious what you have to say if I brought up a long line. Um, if you want to talk to other people first, I don't mind. No, no, go ahead. Going first. No. Go, go, go. Here, I'll post it in the, in the chat. Okay. <clears throat> Can you read it, please? Oh, yeah, of course. Go ahead. Uh, so it's still kind of a fresh idea. Um, title, first strike, genre, drama, logline. 
After a false missile strike from an enemy submarine, the U.S. president must battle U.S. generals against making the first strike in the calamity of war. Comps, uh, high and low. The Kurosawa movie? Yeah. It's kind of not in the same, like, field of it, but I really like the tone of it, where wow. it's a guy battling to make a decision. And, you know, like, the, a lot of the conflicts inside it said, I was thinking of Dr. Strangelove, but I also wasn't thinking of making it a dark comedy. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah. Dr. Strangelove is really funny, too. It, I love Dr. Strangelove and I like High and Low, but I think they both might be the wrong comps for this. Um, because mm -hmm. High and Low is a crime drama about, uh, like, a is it like a kidnapping that I believe is what the plot revolves around? Is that right? Um, and the yeah, main yeah, character. Yeah. Right, right, right. So this is about international stakes. And is the main character the president? Yeah, I was going to make it a general, but there's a thing called preemptive first strike, a real, like, policy where the U.S. president could just say, you know, like, we're going to attack first. And that's what they did at Hiroshima. And it almost mm -hmm. happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I see. Okay. So maybe consider, there's a show on HBO called The Brink. Maybe that would be a good comp. Um, maybe people Ooh, have okay. some other ideas. Um, but uh, yeah, Dr. Strangelove is the right sort of world, but you don't, if it's not going to be comedic, then it would be a bad idea to, to choose that. So maybe try swapping out your comps. I think, I think high and low might be kind of too abstract of a comparison. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, okay, okay. Let's go to the logline. So, after a false missile strike from an enemy submarine, the U.S. president must battle U.S. generals against making the first strike in the calamity of war. In the calamity of war. He must... He's trying to convince them not to do the first strike. Is that right? Yeah. I guess doesn't that's, he yeah, have that's the final the say? So, the U.S. president doesn't want to do it, but generals and everyone else is telling him, like, you have to do it they you know like this is just a false missile strike but mm -hmm. what if it's real next time what if they hit you know florida you know i think that was the threat with the cuban missile crisis it's like they started like you know surveillance started to show they had nuclear missiles in cuba and they've been telling them like hey this is an okay kind of thing and mm -hmm. that's where like i was like oh should we like nuke them first kind of thing it, it, i'm trying to think does it make it kind of confusing with the first part it makes it confusing missile. because, for, well, first of all, I don't know what a false missile strike is. I, I, a little. I guess that could be um, a, pro a problem in the first place. Yeah. Second of all, the pres if the president has the final say, then I'm struggling to see how the whole movie can be him just telling people, no, no, we're not going to nuke them. We're not going to nuke them. We're not going <laughs> to nuke them. Because that's what you're sort of, like, the logline is sort of telling yeah. us what we're doing in the majority of the movie. And so you have to be thinking, how can I frame this sentence in such a way that I'm telling us, what are we doing in the, like, the middle, like, the long middle of this movie? And I, I, I struggle to see a movie remaining engaging if it's the president who can just say no, guys, and everyone else trying to convince him to do this, unless there is some kind of escalating threat. Um, so I would think maybe you've picked the wrong main character, or maybe the action of, this, of the story is something different than what I'm kind of imagining. Is this mostly people talking in boardrooms? Yeah, that's kind of why I brought up high and low, because the, mm -hmm. like, the first half of the movie, the first hour, is pretty much in this guy's living room. And he's trying to decide, should I give up the ransom to this kidnapper who has my worker son? And that's kind of like, the battle is to, up to him. Like, either way, like, I'm trying to think. But if your main if you character, in, in this case, though, if your main character did nothing, what would happen? Um, if he did nothing, I'm trying to think. You don't have oh, to I have see, all I the see. answers. There's no... Go ahead. Yeah, yeah there's no... Red, I guess. Well, in my head, I'm picturing like Hiroshima and then the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis. In one case, we did do preemptive strike. In one case, mm -hmm. we did not. Right. So, you know, with Hiroshima, um, the, you know, the pros of, you know, attacking first was that it's going to save lives. It's, you know, in the long term, that's what it's going to do. So I guess the threat is an immediate, um, you know, with him saying no. But the threat is that long-term thing of like, you know, like, oh, in a false missile strike, I was thinking like the, <clears throat> I think it was like two or three years ago in Hawaii, the whole like oh, uh, state, got, yeah, 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 the whole state got this false missile crisis. And you just have these like waves of people thinking, oh my God, is this the last, you know, am, am I going to die right now? Yeah. This is serious. I kind of want to see so movies about that. that. That I'm sure there's a bunch of movie ideas that you could get from that, um, that incident. Um, but but in this case, um, for 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 a movie, it's kind of abstract to say 
if he doesn't act, then generally the political situation might mm-hmm. kind of deteriorate over time. You see what I mean? It's so much yeah. less less concrete and tangible than if you don't do this, then they're going to nuke us. Um, so I think that you maybe just need to look at the elements you have here and ask yourself, one, did I pick the wrong main character? Two, maybe <laughs> did I not design a situation with enough urgency and intensity? Because if there's not a concrete threat, then the main character could do nothing and everything would be fine, right? And so we want to avoid that sense from movies. Movies are usually about main characters that need to act with that high level of urgency and engagement in order to accomplish their goal, or else something bad will happen because tension comes at that intersection of dread and hope. But we, it only works if we have both. We have to dread that something bad will happen and hope that something good will happen. Right now, I'm hoping that the president will see sense and not launch a nuke and start a war. What am I dreading? that he will fail okay. to do that i guess i don't know yeah so um maybe just decide where is the where's the conf- where's the tension really coming from um and if if for instance your main character is one of these people that has to convince the president to not launch a nuke now suddenly i'm much more like do you see how that's so much more concrete if oh, the president see, presses yeah. that button we're screwed so maybe it's is the main character the vice president or the top general or something like that maybe that person would have a clearer and more concrete goal that exists within the realm of what we're doing in the movie. Like, with, like it, it puts the most important people in the room together. Rather than... Because in that case, the, the, your, your adversary is the president. And we need to now convince the president to not do this. And maybe if you chose like a really kind of wild card president... I think we've seen some examples of those in the past couple years. Um, if you have a really wild card president, for instance, then that could feel really dangerous. It could feel like a really volatile situation. And only the clearest head in the room could solve it. But... It can't be the person that controls the final decision, can it? Unless the tension's coming from somewhere else. So I'm not sure what the answers to that are, and maybe you're not sure yet either. It might just require a little more stirring the soup or whatever to to sort of um, uh, pull out a a really strong functional idea. But does that give you some some ideas to, to start thinking about how can I increase that level of tension and conflict and give my main character a really clear goal with high repercussions, high stakes? Yeah, yeah, no, it definitely makes a lot of sense. Uh, I read what Nacho put in, and it's kind of the same thing you were mentioning. He said instead of uh, making it the U.S. president who has the choice, it's a submarine captain who's, like, pressing the button, you know, and his superiors are the ones that are telling him, like, you know, send it out, send it out. Sure, and we do that sort of thing where during the Cuban Missile Crisis or during, I guess, just the Cold War, I forget exactly when this was, there were a couple incidents like that, weren't there, where, like, some (laughs) Russian general was like no let's hold let's just wait a second and double confirm it and everyone was like push the button um i think there were a few incidents like that so yeah do we could frame a whole movie around the crew of a silo or the crew of a submarine or some something like that where we're watching the people actually responsible for launching the strike itself um there's lots lots of different ways you can go with this i mean it's a very dramatic very high stakes situation so um you you can kind of approach it from whichever angle you'd like Any questions? Okay, on this? but yeah, or this helps any, out a lot. Sure, sure. Oh, any, any other ways I can help you out with this? No, no, I think that's uh, definitely, yeah, yeah. I hadn't considered the, you know, the thing of like, oh, what if he just doesn't, you know, do it? Because, you know, again, it, like in the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, we didn't do it and then like nothing happened. Yeah. But it's because we didn't know nothing was going to happen. Right? Yeah, it turned out that was the best case scenario for no one to do anything. <laughs> like, that's what we wanted. Um, but, but for a movie, yeah, that's tough to 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 like we we don't if if we're not looking back in at history then some like if the if that cuban missile crisis has had gone totally differently then we would have been like come on why didn't the president do something um in any case i hope that gives you some ideas and some ways to start maybe reframing the elements that you have here in a more dramatic way oh yeah that helps a lot thank you connor thanks kevin okay so um, I think we're going to move to do some slides on structure. So whether or not you just shared a logline, you should, of course, still be refining your logline and still be working and still be always have your sketchbook open in a boot camp class and be writing down ideas and questions and things you aren't sure about. And any anything and everything needs to be written down in the sketchbook. So if you've not already filled out that sketchbook, you should be filling that out at all times during classes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And then I didn't ask it because just because of t- for time reasons, I didn't ask about blacklist scripts. But next week I will be asking what blacklist script did you read? What did you think? What did you like? What did you notice? What did you learn? Questions like that. So you should absolutely be reading a script every week at the absolute minimum. I recommend more like three scripts a week. 
Um, so we've gone over the ground rules already. We're in week two. We're going to go right to structure. So structure is going to be the organization of events in your story. It is the thing that gives coherence to the narrative and makes it feel like a series of connected events that are summing up to something big that has a point that is saying something about the world and is sort of entertaining at the same time. So the action of the movie is going to be what we're visually watching, and that's going to be sort of carrying us through this external journey that the characters are going on, and then the characters will have uh, internal goals as well that they are going to interweave as the movie goes on, and so by the end, completing the external goal will usually coincide with completion of the character's internal goal, and all of that will sum up into some kind of dramatic argument, which is some statement that you as the filmmaker seem to be making about the world. Whether or not you intend for there to be a dramatic argument for your story, one will kind of emerge and people will just pick one that seems most likely to them if you don't go in with this with some sense of designing this in mind. So we won't probably get way too into theme stuff today, for today, but that's just something to think about, is that every story is a persuasive document of some kind. Um, because you can't show somebody without, or you can't show a person's story without generating at least a little bit of sympathy for them. Um, and to that end, or because of that, we need to be thinking of, well, who, who am I, what, what message does this story seem to be sending? What statement about life or human nature or the world does it seem like that this story is essentially asserting? I mean, if you m give us a movie about a character that tries their hardest again and again and again, and they're always picking themselves up no matter how many times they get knocked down, and even at the end they get knocked down again and they still smile their way through it, well, maybe we're sort of saying the best way to live is to always approach the world with this glass half full mentality it's like maybe that wasn't what you intended with that story but that's what the audience might take out of it um because if we see your main character continue to be happy even after they've lost then of course we're still we're gonna wonder why like how why would you be happy after losing and that is where your sort of dramatic argument is going to come into play so the dramatic argument doesn't have to be something brand new it doesn't your movie doesn't have to be saying something that no one's ever heard before you can make a movie that's sort of all about how love is more important than money or how families is, you know, family conquers all, blood is thicker than water. You can pick something that like has been established or we know already, but sometimes you'll find that these simple truths that we can forget at times make some of the strongest and simplest dramatic arguments. So structure is your friend. It's not here to fight you. Um, it's not attacking you, so don't be afraid of it. Um, it is and a series of tools that are going to help guide you from beginning to end and it's going to help you not only write a coherent movie but also it's going to help you finish a movie when a lot of people they struggle to finish because they have no understanding of structure or they feel they can rush through certain parts of it or they feel like i don't need to figure out what happens in advance and that leads to them getting stuck without any idea of what to do next or why they should do it next because if you don't know what the role of each section of a story is then you can't know if you're doing it well or not um, so you got to read lots of scripts. There's no way around this. Every single week we will be asking, except for this week, every week we'll be a we will be asking, what did you read? What did you like? What did you notice? What did you learn? Read a brand new script every week very carefully. Take notes, pay attention, and read actively and immersively. You've got to read like a writer. Write things on the sides of the, of the script, on the margins. Circle things. Use your pencil. Whatever it is you have to do, you have to be reading scripts to understand what a good script looks and feels like and what each of these different sections is for. And you're not going to have like a, a full like grasp of what each section does unless you see, well, some people need to see a bunch of repetition, re repetitive examples of it. Or even if you learn very quickly and you don't need a bunch of examples, you should still see some very clear, strong examples on the page, not just from movies we've seen in the past in on the screen. We need to be looking on the page and understanding what a really good movie looks and feels like on the page. What does a really great reveal look like? What does a scare look like on the page? If you're writing a horror movie and don't know what a scare looks like on the page, something's wrong. You need to be reading the kind of movie that you want to watch. What does an action scene look like on the page? What does a romantic scene look like? These things aren't going to exactly always be exactly what you imagined from just watching it on screen. So that's why we have to be reading actively and paying attention. And um, that's the only way to sort of burn some of these things into your brain. So for all the talk that I do about this, then um, you'll, you will learn just as much or more from simply reading. And Nacho has posted in the chat, thank you, Nacho, a list of um, over a thousand pro scripts from the blacklists from the past couple of years. So definitely click on that if you need scripts to choose from. And if it asks you to request access, then just click request access and you should get it. Okay, um, so I'm not going to go on too into art house and experimental stuff, though we did have somebody sort of pitching and more experimental story. So I will just briefly mention, um, 
most of the time, if you're trying to break into writing mainstream Hollywood movies, uh, if you aren't writing mainstream more mainstream Hollywood movies, then your shenanigans will be interpreted as ignorance from your readers. So it could be that you're like, I don't even want to bother with structure. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm just going to do a series of nine sort of episodic scenes that all connect from ideas. Something like that. You can do that. Like, it's not, there's no one saying you, there's no way you can possibly do that. But if you're trying to break into mainstream screenwriting, most of the time we're going to look at that and say, and I guess I should put it like this. If we, if we read that and we start to lose interest or fade away or we start to wonder why you're doing it like this, our first question will almost always be, have you considered putting this into a more traditional structure that people are waiting are, are you know um more used to seeing um a structure that we are more familiar with and just leads to more satisfying stories um generally you know there's so there's no limits on what you can actually pull off but you might just have to demonstrate for us that something works if your idea of what you want to write is totally different from things that are making lists getting signed or getting writers signed um getting picked up getting optioned getting sold things like that so you should read the blacklist to see the kind of stuff that is getting sold, the stuff that is getting optioned, and you can gain an understanding of the kind of material that is viable in the marketplace. If you're writing something that is intentionally super art house and abstract, um, you'll probably have to make it yourself. And if you do, and if you nail it, if you really kill it, then we're all going to be like, you're a genius. I should have seen. I should have seen your vision. Um, but that's not to say that structure is going to hold you back from doing really weird, different movies. Like, you can write a three-act, straight straight down the middle three-act movie and have it be the weirdest thing someone's ever seen. I got that reaction several times on some of my movies, and including my script that was a nickel semi-finalist. I got reader comments that are saying, like, I have never read anything like this. So it's not to say that structure is holding you back. In fact, it's sort of helping. It's pushing you forward, and it's allowing you to put these strange, different ideas into a package that people will be able to appreciate more generally, like a general reader will be able to appreciate more. Um, okay, so uh, that's just a note on that sort of stuff. Let's go into nitty-gritty act stuff. So what's an act? Uh, it's a sequence, uh, because a sequence is just a group of scenes, right? A movie is comprised of many different sequences. The biggest sequences are going to be the acts, though. An act is a group of scenes. Our first act, our first group of scenes, is the setup. It's going to take us to a break into two. When we transition from one act into another act, we call that an act break, not a plot point, which they do in a lot of novel writing courses so don't get confused we call these act breaks so our first act is the setup where we're going to be meeting your main character we're going to be learning about the normal world that they exist in until some kind of inciting incident happens which shakes up that normal world usually by presenting some kind of opportunity to your main character or maybe it's them being denied something that they want and it's just creating the sense of what does your main character do now that a wrench has been thrown into the gears and i've been given some incident that has asked me to act or has compelled me to act that inciting incident is going to then lead to a section of the movie uh, that we call trying the locks which is between the the catalyst and the act break but our act break is in it we'll, we'll talk about that soon your act break is going to really propulsively move us into the meat of the movie which we say the act two is the movie so this see how it's, how much longer it is than the other two so it's the majority of the story um, this we call the we might look at as the confrontation sequence where your main character now that we've moved from the ordinary world into this kind of upside down world of the second act now they're going to actually do the fun interesting engaging things that you promised us this movie would be about and so the second act is where you deliver on those early promises that you set up in the beginning on the poster in the trailer all that stuff the stuff that we came to the movie for should be really evident in act two so you need to pay off those promises and Act in, and and you should make sure that your that your script is is generally feeling like it has that sense of setup and payoff, where things that are introduced are then answered, or things like if we put a gun on the mantelpiece, then a character later has to find and use that gun, and you know the Chekhov's gun kind of thing. Like we we generally want to see setups being paid off to feel like we're building confidence in the in the writer, and that those questions that are unanswered will be answered, and our patience will ultimately be rewarded by continuing to watch this. So we're going to be leading up to that midpoint. Whoop, right there, right there. The midpoint, there it is. Whoop, midpoint. Um, and that is directly in the center of the story. What does the midpoint do? It raises the stakes. So I would write that down if you don't know what the midpoint does. That is the automatic answer that you should have every time, no matter the nuances of the midpoint, and whether it's a plot twist, whether it's a new piece of information or a new clue or a reversal, 
Whatever it is, it's something that raises the stakes. So write that down. Midpoint raises the stakes, if you do not know that already. Then we're going to be leading up to that break into three, where you're going to be piling up the cost of this journey on your main character. And the obstacles are getting harder, and their allies are starting to falter, and their enemies are starting to regroup, and the relationships are starting to deteriorate, and your main character is starting to suffer physically, mentally, morally. And we're leading up to this break into three, which, like, um, you know, before we get there, we're going to have to hit your main character really hard and knock them down into what we call the all is lost moment and continue to kick them on the ground in the pit of despair until they're sort of, sort of forced eventually to realize the truth that they've been ignoring up until now or something that they didn't realize or something, some internal change that they're going to have to make in order to approach Act 3 with some kind of new mindset. Whether or not this actually leads them to victory is totally up to you. It's not to say your main character has to surge upwards into victory and win the day every time. Maybe they misidentify what the thing that they have to learn is, and that can lead to a kind of tragedy, right? Or maybe they double down and they totally ignore the opportunity to change and they become even worse, like a movie like Nightcrawler. Um, but a lot of the time we're watching your main character kind of realize and rationalize this truth that they've been ignoring or avoiding. And as we move into Act 3, with this renewed sense of purpose, it's going to be um, a finale. We're going to lead into a finale that showcases how your main character has changed. Because the finale is going to demonstrate them doing something they never could have done before this journey occurred. So because of the tools they've gained and whatever they've learned and however they've developed over the course of the tale, now in the finale they're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the oppositional forces one more time, whatever those things are, and they're gonna have, we're going to have a big final showdown, whatever that looks like for your genre. And then your character either wins or they lose. And then we have a couple scenes afterwards, which we call like the epilogue, essentially. Um, and we're going to wrap up pretty quickly. We don't want to go on way too long after the climax. But, you know, within three or four scenes, usually, of the climaxes, we're going to wrap everything up and be done. Ultimately, your movie should be 90 to 120 pages long. Um, if you're newer at this, aim for a shorter movie. I would recommend, at least, because it's just easier to work with shorter stories. Um... And uh, if you're writing something like horror or thriller, you can get away with even shorter, like 80 to 90. Actually, I see those sell all the time in, um, in horror or thriller. And like 85 is actually considered kind of a sweet spot for horror or thriller. Um, so uh, no actual strict requirements on page counts, but that is just the general guidelines. You want to, if you want to work as a screenwriter professionally, you should be looking at writing full-length stories, full-length movies, or full-length pilots in that 8 to 12 week time frame, um, at least for that very first draft. And then um, being able to move to that to those next stages. The next draft would be, you know, two to three weeks per draft after that. Generally, you're going to be writing about three or four drafts and then moving on to the next project because 99.9% .9 of movies don't get made. And we're looking at this primarily as practice and we're improving. We're going to the gym, we're lifting weights and running laps. And that's why I recommend you pick something that you're not way too attached to and not something that you're going to have to honor your family by getting every detail just right you're gonna pick something you know you can get excited about and you know that you can accomplish because it is within your scope the scope of your abilities within the eight weeks of the course okay um so act one setup act two confrontation act three is climax and resolution here's a more um expanded look at structure we will go more into this just pretty soon um but uh you can see this we're using this kind of roller coaster type approach and we might think of that roller coaster as like the level of tension in the story right where we're increasing that tension more and more as the story goes on and it might sort of dip and wane at times but ultimately it is trending upwards until it reaches the highest possible point which is going to be that break into three in that finale and then it ramps down very quickly afterwards as we tie off all our loose threads and we sort of come into a landing at that epilogue really with an understanding of what the argument was what the point was we should understand why we watched this. Okay, so um, I'm going to pause and ask for questions before I get too into any of these one points. Um, so before I actually break down all of the different pieces of a three-act story like this, um, let me just pause for questions so far on anything we've talked about up until now. So feel free to raise your hand or type in the text chats. You should see a hand icon at the bottom row of buttons here. Hi, Joya. Make sure to unmute yourself. Just click that gray microphone icon. Hello? 
I hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Um, can you put up that very first part about the structure, that first page? This one? Or, or um, this? No. The, the, the one getting into structure just overall. This? Yes. Okay. Did you have a question about something on here? Oh. Um, no, I was going to, like, write it out manually so it'll, so I can internalize it, but I didn't catch it before uh, okay. went I, to the next one. I can just, I'll link you the slideshow if you want to just have the whole thing. Oh, okay, great. And thanks. There we go. I posted it in the chat, so you should see a link to Feature Bootcamp Week 2, and that should have every slide on there. This is slide number um, 18. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Other questions on anything we've talked about so far? Ninety nine square. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I was just wondering a little bit about midpoints. Um, mm -hmm. So like, I'm trying to think of like specific examples, but like I'm trying I'm having a little bit of a hard time because like I can think like really clearly of movies about like the all is lost pit of despair, despair moments mm -hmm. but like just and most of like my stories like there isn't really a midpoint like where something happens it just kind of is like building up to the pit of despair so i was just wondering if you could um break that down a little bit more sure yeah i'd be glad to i thought i may have had a slide just on midpoint on this one but i guess that might be in a different slideshow but that's okay um i can get into that um, okay, sure. Let's just start with midpoints then if we're going to uh, look at structure. I'll keep this up behind me. Um, so midpoint is a moment directly in the middle where the stakes raise and we maybe reveal some new information that we weren't sure about up until now. Or maybe we kill the first monster, but now we realize, oh crap, there's a whole nest of monsters. Um, or we find the criminal, but it turns out he's part of a cult. And now we need to actually, you know, like um, uh, deal with way more opponents than we thought we would be. So, for instance, let's just take New Hope, for instance. So, New Hope, what's the midpoint? Well, we team up with Han Solo in the, in the early part of our sort of premise scenes, and we warp to where Alderaan is supposed to be, but wait a minute, it's gone. And now the stakes are exponentially raised when we see this super weapon is starting to pull our team into it, and they get captured by the Empire. So there's just one example from New Hope, right? Right in the middle of the movie. As, and it's some and this is what midpoints often do is they will introduce some new direction some new information it's some kind of twist or development of of some kind um, so in this case it's we realize the empire is capable of destroying planets and now we've been captured by them so it's a pretty big escalation in two huge ways um, and there's I mean you can kind of go through and find like often it will be some sort of we think that we have won early on or we think we've overcome a huge initial hurdle of this journey. So it might be that, like, we have defeated one villain, but it turns out we had the wrong guy, or maybe there's another one we didn't know about. Um, or it could be that your main characters actually um, seem as if they are, if, if, if things are just getting worse and worse and worse and worse, then this might be a moment that seems like, oh, crap, it's all over. How could we possibly defeat this? So it's always going, it, it's always going to be raising the stakes, but it's often going to be introduction of some new piece of information or a reversal of existing information. Like, it's going to change our direction, even if it's only a little bit. Um, and I can give more examples, if maybe just name a movie, and I can tell you if I know what the midpoint is. Did you, I could, What about The Ring? Do you know the horror movie The Ring? I have not seen that, unfortunately. You've not seen it. Name a movie, and I'll tell you if I know the midpoint. Uh, the Matrix. The Matrix. Okay, so um, the, so in The Matrix, he... Oh, it's um, Cypher killing everybody, isn't it? So this is when... Um, the midpoint of the matrix is after we have all those cool, like Morpheus gets captured, right? And then as our crew is trying to get back home, it turns out they've been betrayed by someone on their team who unplugs almost everybody. Right, right. So stakes yeah, are just... way higher, right? Because this is our first human traitor mm -hmm. that we've even met. Um, and so the we know that humans are going to be working against Neo from now on. Morpheus is captured. And now we have to totally rethink how we approach the main problem of the movie. All right, cool. Thank you. Sure. Hope that helps. Mm -hmm. Other questions? We have a text question from Jotul that I can read out if he wants to do it that way. 
Do I think most structures are just three act structures but articulated differently? Or are there other specific versions I think are largely different? Um, that's a good question. Um, so generally my thought is that most of them actually, you're right, yes, are more just like three act, but that have been framed in slightly different terms. Um, we can look at all these other ones, I mean, but look how even Kisho Tenketsu looks just like the, 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 what do you call it, the roller coaster. Um, we could, like, just do a side-by-side -side on them if we wanted to, but um, there, there are other cultures of storytelling, and there are many different traditions of this from through all time, and I'm not going to profess to understand them all, or to know about them all, or um, to, to have a, a, a really wide understanding of different worldwide storytelling styles. But in the ones that I've seen, the ones that I'm familiar with, they all pretty much look like this. Yeah, even the five act, you kind of break it down and you're like, oh, it's kind of like three acts, isn't it? Or we could take a two act. I mean, I write plays all the time. Plays are two acts generally. But the way you slice it up, like if you slice it just a little bit differently, squish the Play-Doh back together and take your razor blade and just go put it in two different spots, it still pretty much works as a three act story with some with some differences. There are there are some um, changes to, from between two and three act. But yeah, in, in my general answer to that question is, yeah, they're all kind of looking like this. They all pretty, well, the ones I'm familiar with behave like this. Um, he's requested to speak, come on up. Oh, yeah, I just, uh, I just typed in the chat. I'm not sure if you saw it. Yeah, how, how would a two-act structure work in that regard? Like, I understand it's probably just set up, payoff, simplified in some way, but I can't imagine. I, I imagine, they, as you said, they would, they would still. Uh, sort of beats. But how, what's the basis of the justification behind it being two act? Sure. So, two act is a theatrical structure, like we see this in plays most of the time. Um, and it's mostly coming from this idea of. How long can an audience sit there for and comfortably pay attention to something that's happening in front of them? Which after about, you know, like an hour and a half, which is around what most plays first act is, then people just need a break. Um, and so it's helpful to have that break. But with that break comes this expectation that we're resetting the energy of the room. So that's that big difference between two act and three act is that the midpoint is like a stopping point. So we have to think of it. Yes, it is a raising of stakes, but it should also be a kind of cliffhanger. That, that sense of the midpoint being a cliffhanger does not exist in 3-act at all. Does that make sense? So we're trying to bring the audience back and convince them to return after the intermission. And so that's going to require, first of all, the, the first act break to end on a sense of something urgent is on the other side of this. Like, we, 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 you need to come back to see how this plays out in the same way that a commercial break on a TV show kind of insists you have to come back to see how this is going to play out. The other thing is that when we return from that midpoint, that, or from that from that break from one into two, we have to start it with a much higher level of energy because we're trying to re re get the audience back into the their engaged mode. Like they've just been drinking sodas and talking with their friends in the lobby for 10 minutes or 15 or 20 minutes. So now when they get back into it, they need to be kind of um, gripped yet again. And we need to maintain their engagement all the way up until the finale and then end pretty much right away. So that midpoint is of course going to be the biggest distinction in between two act and three act where in, in our two-act structure, um, we're looking at that midpoint as a stopping place and as a point where we now need to convince people to return afterwards. I guess it's kind of subtle. It's kind of similar in the idea. It's still at that midpoint. You're sort of building to a, you're almost building to a high point. And then the midpoint would sort of, as opposed to it just being a flip of some sort of twist or anything like that. But it is, it seems like you kind of want to escalate the stakes. So that would also probably work as a hook to some degree. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's well, a, bit more, but a little bit different in the, those distinctions. Mm -hmm. I guess, is there, is there a specific example? Um, I know this probably isn't exactly what we want to dive into, but is there any specific example in terms of like that two act structure that you think utilizes that well off the top of your head? Like the only thing I can think of um, that kind of did that is only I don't know if it's like Al Pacino. There was a movie that turned into a movie. Al Pacino. He's a he's a uh, he's like a, 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 a salesperson. He's like 
I'm going to say some uh, examples that you can think of off the top of your head that utilize that well. Do uh, so you mean like from plays or movies that have? Because there aren't a lot of movies that have two act structure. So you're, you're asking what's just an example of how a play uses that? Yeah. Okay, sure. So how about in the Beetlejuice musical? The Beetlejuice musical, it splits in half directly after the Banana Boat song, which sort of represents the main character has teamed up with this ghost that she's going to try to essentially use to scare her dad so badly that he lets them move away from their current house. So the whole first act has been teaming up with this ghost, and now we're trying to see if we can work with him. Is he going to betray us? Um, what is he? What are his powers? What is he capable of? And then by the time that partnership really kicks into gear, it is going to represent he, or it's going to it's, it represents the moment where he actually starts to influence the family, and he starts to possess people and do crazy stuff around the house. So we sort of get the sense of this is what the next act is going to contain. Like we see our first taste of his crazy ghost hijinks in this huge song. And then we're sort of setting this promise of, and when you come back, there's going to be way more of that kind of hijinks. So it's like we've, we're moving from one story world into the next one. We're moving from the non-supernatural world into the more supernatural one. Um, and on the other side, we, we, of course, open the next act with a really energetic song to represent. Now our human and the ghost are working together. Now we're going to be having all the fun that we can mine from that concept of human working with ghosts to scare people. So it sort of is like a, a little mini preview of all the fun that is to come afterwards, after we get back. Oh, well, how would that be contrasted with the film? I haven't watched the film personally, but is it do something different in that section? I'm trying to remember exactly what the, how the movie is structured different than the Broadway show. I'm struggling at the moment to recall exactly, um, but I'd be glad to follow up on that later once sure, I okay. refresh myself on how it goes. Yeah. 